This week on the Green Left News Podcast, the ecological impact of Israel's war on Gaza, disease and war in Sudan, and a wrap-up of 2023. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm joined by Green Left activist journalists Chloe Diaz and Gabriel DeFalco. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. Hey, everyone. So the 9th and 10th weekends of huge protests for Palestine took place on December 9th and 10th and 16th and 17th, mobilizing tens of thousands to end Israel's war on Gaza. And the pressure of these rallies and all the countless smaller actions that are taking place everywhere else are having an impact, with Labor finally breaking from the United States and voting for a ceasefire at the United Nations General Assembly, along with 153 other countries. But Labor's statement still shows its strong support for Israel, and it does not mean ending weapons shipments or other support for the genocide. And Labor should be ashamed that it took so long for them to even call for a weak ceasefire. We are Protesters have promised to continue rallying over the holiday period and into the new year until Israel ends its occupation and Palestine is free, with some people holding signs that say, while people are shopping, bombs are dropping and the protests aren't stopping. Rallies in Karatha in Western Australia, the Gold Coast, Dandenong, Katoomba in the Blue Mountains show that the Palestine Solidarity Movement is not limited to the major cities, but it is spreading to regional communities and smaller cities. Rallies outside Labour MP offices have continued, including Albanese's office in Marrickville, Kate Thwaites in Heidelberg, Education Minister Jason Clare and Treasurer Jim Chalmers in Mianjin, Brisbane. It's also been great to see all of the grassroots organised groups coming together for Palestine. At the most recent rally on the weekend, I saw mums for Palestine, trade unionists for Palestine, even vegans for Palestine. Another one of these groups is the healthcare workers for Palestine who organised a vigil for the people of Palestine, particularly medical workers in Gadi or Sydney on December 8th. And it was one of many similar gatherings by healthcare workers around the world just being encouraged by Gaza Medic Voices, which is publishing first-hand accounts from healthcare workers in Palestine. And the following week, on December 15th, healthcare workers marched from the Sydney Eye Hospital to the rocks to show their solidarity with Palestine. At its 2023 national conference, the National Union of Students voted unanimously to support Palestine. 156 delegates representing 23 university campuses across Australia voted to support a block of five motions on December 12th. These include publishing a statement about Palestine, freeing Layan Qaid and all Palestinian political prisoners, condemning the Israeli government's destruction of human rights and standing against Islamophobia. The NUS has since posted a media release confirming their public support, with a particular emphasis on resisting the second Nakba currently taking place in Gaza. Students for Palestine activist Jasmine Al-Rawi said it is a really good step that the National Union of Students has adopted a pro-Palestine position, but that it is also important to continue fighting and actually put these motions into action. And talking about getting into action, a delegation of activists who wanted to question Talas on its links to Israel's genocide in Palestine was denied entry into the weapons manufacturer's office in Garamilla or Darwin on December 15. And Talas has a partnership with Israeli Aerospace Industries and Elbit Systems, which is an Israeli defense electronics company, and has produced weapons including the Sea Serpent, which is a surface-to-surface guided missile with a range of 200 kilometers, and also killer drones. And Palestinian human rights groups have launched proceedings in the federal court to expose all arms exports to Israel since October 7. And Justin Tuddy from the Top End Peace Alliance said that for weapons companies, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is just a business opportunity. They're expecting to make big profits. 
The delegation reminded Tyler's that it has no social license to operate, but Tyler's staff blockaded the door with a Christmas tree and refused to talk to the delegation or even receive a letter. Meanwhile, in Geelong, a vigil was held outside City Hall on December 12th to protest the council's refusal to discuss a motion calling for ceasefire. As was previously reported, Socialist Alliance councillor Sarah Hathaway tried to put a permanent ceasefire motion for council to debate only for the unelected council CEO to block it from being put, claiming it would incite violence. After speakers addressed the crowd, they marched into the council meeting with their banners and placards. Council again refused to debate the motion and protesters marched out, chanting, Free Palestine and other slogans. They remain chanting outside the council meeting, forcing security to close the doors. Free Palestine Geelong spokesperson Noah Al-Asafi told Green Left she thought council and the mayor's responses were racist because they were ignoring the Middle Eastern community's trauma. Hathaway said the only bright note was that a majority of councillors voted down a motion to reverse the decision not to celebrate Australia Day on January 26. Meanwhile, the City of Sydney Council decided at its final meeting of the year on December 11 to support a motion urging the federal government to support international efforts for an immediate, sustainable and humanitarian ceasefire to enable peace negotiations and a pathway to achieving lasting peace. The motion was an initiative of local residents who wrote to independent councillor Yvonne Weldon, Team Clover independent Imelda Davis, and Greens councillor Sylvie Ellsmore, urging them to join with the tens of thousands of people in the streets every week to urge Australia to support an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Residents and Palestinian activists rallied outside Sydney Town Hall just before the council met. I know that the ceasefire motion tonight may not go as far as many people want, but it will mean something so much and the Australian government will hear us if we do it. So if we do do it tonight, and I hope we do, I'm optimistic, we will be doing it because of you, and I hope it is strength to your arm because we all know there is such a long journey. So thank you. Another sign that the huge movement for Palestine is having an impact is that the mainstream media, which has unwaveringly supported Israel's genocide and censoring journalists who try to report the truth about what is happening in Gaza, is starting to lash out against activists and even Green Left. On December 10th, as the ninth straight weekend of huge Palestine rallies was underway, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age published a hit piece by conservative commentator Parnell Palm McGuinness, which called the Palestine solidarity movement left-wing populism, comparable to Trumpism. The article is blatant fear-mongering designed to undercut the Palestine movement. McGuinness cites an interaction with young university students from Socialist Alliance to attack young people in general as ignorant and vulnerable to conspiracy theories. She accused Green Left and Socialist Alliance of peddling in the murky world of conspiracy theories. McGuinness's assertion that Green Left and Socialist Alliance's opposition to the Israeli apartheid state and its genocidal war on Gaza is populist and conspiratorial reveals the pressure she and the mainstream media are under. Young people are one of the largest cohorts at the Palestine rallies. They are some of the most vocal for justice for Palestine. According to a recent YouGov poll, 62% of people aged 18 to 24 years old think the federal government should call for an immediate ceasefire. Increasingly too, young people are not relying on establishment media for their news because they can see through the bias and absurdity of reporting by people such as McGuinness. Yeah, and if you want to help Green Left tell the stories that the mainstream media won't tell, you can become a supporter from as little as $5 a month. And we're coming up on the holiday period now, so you could even get your friends a gift subscription. So head to greenleft.org.au forward slash support or click the link in the description to become a supporter. During the voice referendum, 
Labor claimed that it was a strong supporter of First Nations rights. But on December 6th, it voted down a bill introduced by Independent Senator and Jabwarung woman Lydia Thorpe to uphold First Nations rights by enacting processes included in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or the UNDRIP. Well, what can I say? Another day in the colony. We had the Labor government vote against Indigenous rights in this country. So the Australian government is an international embarrassment right now. The bill was supported by Green Senators and also Independent Senator David Pocock. And 21 housing justice groups from across the country organised a national Housing is a Human Right Day of Action, coinciding with International Human Rights Day. They call on Labor to provide for more public housing and a rent freeze. And the National Housing Justice Campaign said housing and shelter is a fundamental human right, not a commodity. Activists gathered in Nam or Melbourne, Waterloo, Ngadi and Bunjalung, Lismore and Wagga Wagga to condemn state government plans to demolish public housing and highlight the dire need for more public housing and better renters' rights. The Corner Yurta or Adelaide action took place online due to extreme weather. And Homelessness Australia estimates that at least 750,000 people are living in housing stress and 640,000 families are in desperate need of secure housing. The final report of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Review was published on December 7th and confirms the trajectory of cuts to funding and services that Labor began in April when it cut annual NDIS spending growth from 13.8% to no more than 8%. The central aim of the NDIS review was redirected to find ways to reduce costs to improve its so-called sustainability and as NDIS Minister Bill Shorten's National Press Club speech revealed, this means cutting funding and making it harder for people to get much-needed support. More than 150,000 of the 610,000 NDIS participants are children under 9 years old. 65% of participants aged 7 to 14 have been diagnosed with autism, according to a 2021 paper submitted to the National Disability Insurance Agency. The NDIS review has decided that a diagnosis of autism or any other will no longer guarantee access to the NDIS. Instead, access will be determined by vague criteria around functional capacity by a needs assessor. The review also continues the exclusion of people aged 65 and over who are forced into the aged care system. As disability advocate Graham Matthews wrote in his Green Left article, NDIS is a frustrating and bureaucratic system which forces people with disability to continually fight for the right to live their lives as they would like. It is inadequate, indifferent, and unsympathetic. Nevertheless, it does guarantee support free of charge for needs that have been assessed as being reasonable and necessary. The proposals in the NDIS review upend that guarantee and remove critical support in the name of cost-cutting. Now, after more than a decade of campaigning, the New South Wales public sector wage cap has been scrapped. The Industrial Relations Amendment Bill 2023 was passed on November 30, which removes the coalition-imposed wages cap of 3% on public sector workers. Unions New South Wales Secretary Mark Morey said on December 1st that removing the cap means our essential public sector workers can now bargain and campaign for fair pay rises. The bill passed after years of protests, industrial campaigns, strikes and mass rallies by nurses, teachers, paramedics, firefighters and public transport workers. The new law will also bring back the Industrial Relations Court, a dedicated court for unions to pursue industrial disputes. It will also establish workplace health and safety prosecutions within the court so that unions can prosecute employers who breach their work health and safety responsibilities. However, Green's Industrial Relations spokesperson Jenny Leong expressed concern that the bill could mean a de facto wage cap by stealth and moved an amendment that any decision must take into account low-paid workers and not just government finances, 
but Labor did not accept it. And some good news is that part of the New South Wales government's harsh and draconian anti-protest laws have been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court on December 13. In a case brought by Knitting Nanas Dominique Jacobs and Helen Cavella, who were represented by the Environmental Defenders Office. And the EDO argued that the laws that made protests blocking or partially blocking ports, train stations, airports and ferries a criminal act impermissibly burdened the implied freedom of political communication in the Constitution. Justice Michael Walton found the laws to be partially invalid. However, he did rule that if disruption damaged the facility or obstructed people trying to use it, or led it to being completely closed, then that would still be an offence. Cavella said she was happy the court had given some acknowledgement to the democratic right to protest, and that the anti-protest laws are about distracting people from getting angry at the real climate criminals, fossil fuel bosses and politicians. Pride in protest spokesperson Luke Javier Velez told a speak out ahead of the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras annual general meeting on December 9th that it must advocate, fight for, and stand with the grassroots movement for queer and trans rights. Because attacks on the queer community had been unrelenting, PIP lodged several motions, including Mardi Gras, showing solidarity with First Nations, banning police and military from the parade, and ending the police accords agreement between Mardi Gras and New South Wales Police, which gives police explicit rights to conduct drug checks. Critics argue a peer-led team of LGBTIQ parade organisers, rather than the police, could more effectively monitor safety during the parade. After a heated discussion, around two-thirds of Mardi Gras members voted to tear up the accords. Unfortunately, this does not mean it will definitely be rescinded as the Mardi Gras board still gets the final decision. Mardi Gras also banned discussion on a Pride in Protest motion to support Palestine and the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign. Motions supporting independent MP Alex Greenwich's equality legislation amendment LGBTIQA plus bill 2023 and drag storytime events passed, but motions to support for gender affirmation leave, defending performers from transphobic harassment and cutting ties with American Express and Qantas did not pass. In Bulu, Perth, LGBTQ plus activists are stepping up the pressure on Labor to deliver promised reforms to the Equal Opportunity Act 1984 and to abolish the Gender Reassignment Board. Queer Liberation Bulu activists marched at the Pride WA Parade on November 25th behind a banner which read, ALP is all talk, no action. Equal Opportunity Act reform now. They confronted Rainbow Labor's float, where Premier Roger Cook and Attorney General John Quigley were present. The Premier and Attorney General saw a public relations opportunity in attending the Pride Parade this year, Queer Liberation Borloo said. We decided to let them know that they don't get their PR until they pass the legislation they promised us in 2018, Queer Liberation Borloo also said. Labor has refused to give a timeline on the passing of the bill and won't commit to passing it in this term of government. WA is lagging behind other states on gender reassignment and workplace safety, as the WA Equal Opportunity Act, which protects trans and gender diverse people at work, requires a gender recognition certificate, which many do not have. Alex Wallace from Queer Liberation Borloo told Green Left that WA Labor needs to urgently pass this reform and that delaying it risks the reforms being politicised during an election campaign. Also in Borloo, activists drew the link between climate disaster and war at a protest outside a weapons conference at the convention centre on December 12th. The rally was organised by Stop AUKUS WA in conjunction with Friends of Palestine and Unionists for Palestine and called on the government to focus on the major threat of climate change publicly fund renewables and scrap the AUKUS nuclear submarine deal. It also called for an end to the US, Britain and Australia's support for the war on Gaza. And religious groups are also concerned about the impact of climate change and are coming together to campaign against fossil fuels. The Australian Religious Response to Climate Change uh, organised a multi-faith vigil for climate justice on December 8th 
with attendees marching from St. Bridget's Catholic Church to Albanese's electorate office in Marrickville in Gaddy, Sydney. Father Kevin Dance outlined the Pope's message on the need to act urgently in the no faith in fossil fuels protest. He said mining of coal and gas must end and a Buddhist meditation for peace and climate action was then held, followed by several Christmas carols with the words changed to be about the climate emergency. Well, that sounds that sounds really great. Um, also, a forum organized by the Refugee Action Collective in Victoria and the Refugee Action Coalition Sydney on December 11th discussed the High Court's decision on indefinite detention and the racist backlash. Sanmati Verma from the Human Rights Law Centre outlined the High Court's arguments on the illegality of indefinite detention and discussed a number of court cases that have challenged detention laws. Ian Rintoul from the Refugee Action Coalition said Labour had continued the coalition's anti-refugee policies, including boat turnbacks, offshore detention on Nauru, abandoning refugees who were sent to Papua New Guinea, and the ban on taking refugees from Indonesia. Max Costello, a retired lawyer and Refugee Action Collective activist, noted that 60,000 convicted criminals are released from prison every year. He said the number of people freed from immigration detention after the High Court decision is small. He called for an end to the practice of cancelling people's visas as soon as they are charged with a crime without waiting for the outcome of the trial. Meanwhile, in Geelong, Tamil refugees are taking things into their own hands by holding a protest vigil outside the office of Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles' office beginning on December 11th. They maintain the vigil for five days from 8am to 6pm, with many supporters joining the vigil to show their solidarity. So can you tell me what you're doing here today at the front of Deputy PM Richard Miles' office? Yeah, we are doing some protests again uh, because of the past tax system was unfair. So we want to fix it. The Labour uh, said that when, when they will come to the power, they will fix it. But uh, too long, they didn't fix it. And also, the uh, we are protesting for the 10,000 uh, 10, people who are the limbo. So that's why we are here. And we are here from uh, 11th of uh, December to 15th of uh, December from 8am to 6pm with the peaceful protest. There is chaos on the streets around Balmain and Roselle in Gadi as the new $3.9 billion West Connex tunnel interchanged opened in early December, leading to huge traffic queues and confusion. And hundreds of angry residents gathered at Balmain Town Hall on December 7 to express their fury at the traffic gridlock. Balmain Green's MP Kobe Shetty received huge applause when she pointed to the elephant in the room, the systematic prioritisation of collecting more tolls over transport needs. Peter Hahir, who's a former Roselle Against West Connects activist, told Green Left that this mess was predicted, although it's worse than they imagined. In a West Council Mayor, Darcy Byrne told the meeting that the council would set up an expert committee to look at solutions, but the crowd was not satisfied. Tahir said that tinkering around with lanes and signage is nothing but putting lipstick on a pig. An anti-West Connects campaigner, Andrew Tudor, told Green Left that the only solutions from now on that will have any chance of tackling these local and global problems will be based on a big shift to public and active transport. Workers at Coles and Woolworths supermarkets are going on strike in the week leading up to Christmas as part of the Retail and Fast Food Workers Union campaign for a living wage, secure jobs and safe workplaces. This follows on from the first ever national strike of supermarket workers on October 7th and the follow-up November 3rd coal strike in Victoria. Kicking off on December 20th and December 21st in some stores, the majority will start their strike on Friday, December the 22nd and continue until December 25th, Christmas Day. On December the 22nd, there will be rallies in Borulu, Gadi, Nam and Mianjin. Rafu have also called for a consumer boycott of Coles and Woolies starting December 18th, citing the supermarket's duopoly's record profits. The union said, not only do these companies exploit their workers, they exploit 
us all with their cynical price gouging. During an unprecedented cost of living crisis, Coles and Woolies have made record profits. They expect to make even bigger profits at Christmas time, while their own workers can't afford to shop in their stores. You can support the industrial action by signing the open letter in the podcast description, attending the December 22nd rallies, or joining the boycott, or all three. So this is a story that's been developing for many weeks now, um, and several more Victorian councils have, in the last two days, held votes on motions which they aim to condemn Israel's actions in Gaza and also call for immediate ceasefires. Um, all of these motions are following the path which was trailblazed by the Marybeck City Council, which not only called for a ceasefire but also raised the flag over the Coburg Town Hall. Um, so these councils, the Yarra, Darabin, Human Wyndham, all passed motions um, which were expressing solidarity for the Palestinian people. Um, Darabin's motion uh, had quite a significance um, as it also raised the Palestinian flag over their Preston Town Hall and they are initiating a boycott um, on companies and suppliers that support the illegal occupation of Palestinian territories. So I believe tonight um, they will have another council meeting which will investigate um, avenues in which they can achieve this. Um, and also want to acknowledge Shepparton's uh, motion as well, which was also calling for a ceasefire, but it was narrowly voted down four votes to five. And all of these motions have been in response to increasing pressure from the community, which has been a real driving force in getting these motions to pass and raising awareness of the atrocities being committed in Palestine. This was evident at the Darabin council meeting when there were cheers of delight that rung through Preston Town Hall um, when the motion was passed. Yeah, it's amazing to see all these new councils uh, voting for ceasefire motions across the country and I hope this trend continues into next year as the community continues putting pressure on on local councils. Um, and Chloe, did you want to tell us about this Zim shipping action that took place in Nam uh, over the last couple of days? Yeah, we a, a bunch of us went down to this dock action yesterday, which was Tuesday. Uh, at the time of recording, it was Tuesday, 19th of December. Um, and that was a speak out to say no Israeli ships at Port Melbourne. It was a, it was a really good action. Um, but the role, the role of Zim, the Israeli shipping line, in the development of the Israeli war machine has been relentless. It is a major transporter of weapons of mass destruction. Um, so, you know, where the protesters are have been blockading, um, have been blocking them at 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 every opportunity. There've been, um, you know, there've been protests that have blockades have gone overnight as well. And Zim. We want to show that Zim and any other apartheid ships should be unwelcome in our ports and every other port where people stand against Israel's genocide and war crimes. Um, but yesterday was a bit of a victory because that ship, that Zim ship named Sparrow, turned around, and yeah, it was it was docked at Port Kembla, um, and that was likely due to our planned picket. So that was a clear win, a, a victory. Um, but we still went ahead with the protest. Um, you know, we we wanted to send a message that a strong message to Patrick's and other port managers that apartheid ships are not welcome in our ports, and we'll keep coming back to pick it in the future. So, and it's and it's also a really good opportunity to build a political basis and relationships with um, you know, MUA, um, the union, for future actions at the port. But it was a, a really great rally, and you know, it was good to to see so many people come out for that. It was a few hundred people there. Perfect. Uh, let's now hear what's happening all around the world. Israel's genocidal attack on Gaza rages on with about 20,000 Palestinians killed so far, including thousands of children. 
The genocide in Gaza, which includes mass murder, massacres, torture and ethnic cleansing, exceed what the Zionist forces did in the Nakba, or catastrophe, from 1947 to 1949. The plan behind the Nakba was to clear the land of Palestinians and seize it for Israel by killing thousands and displacing millions. 11,000 were killed. Now, in just over two months, more than 20,000 have been killed. More than 1 million have been displaced from the north to the south. This is a killing and destruction madness that exceeds anything witnessed in the world's wars since the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan in 1945. It has been revealed that this is the biggest carpet bombing campaign in history with more than 15,000 bomb strikes. 70% of those who live in Gaza are women and children. Many children have lived under Israeli occupation their entire lives. More than 4,000 children were killed in the first month of the attack. Western government support for this genocidal war, this second Nakba, has completely shattered any remaining illusions of Western morality and respect for international human rights. Yeah, it's horrifying what's happening in Gaza. The loss of thousands of lives to the Israeli Western war machine is truly sickening. Um, But one of the other impacts that we haven't talked about on the podcast as much is the ecological impact of the war. It was great to see Palestine solidarity protests at the COP28 summit in Dubai earlier this month. And Nada Majdalani, the Palestinian director for EcoPeace Middle East, told Al Jazeera that this war has destroyed every aspect of Gaza's environment. Climate activist Greta Thunberg recently declared that there is no climate justice on occupied land, re-articulating a core demand of left-wing ecological currents from as early as the 1960s, as well as rural and indigenous peoples. And the global military footprint is estimated to account for 5.5% of global emissions, and the settler colonial violence perpetrated against Palestine is no different in this regard. 35 days into Israel's bombardment of Gaza, greenhouse gas emissions from the war were estimated at approximately 60.3 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. And this comes from the release of bombs, white phosphorus, incendiary weapons, the destruction of infrastructure, and fuel and energy intensive military equipment. The landscape has been destroyed, air polluted, habitats pulverized, and water poisoned. And Israel's also seeking to take control of the gas reserves in Gaza and plunder them for billions of dollars. The movement for Palestine's liberation can now add expropriation and ecological ruination among war and genocide to its condemnations of Israel and its allies in the West, especially the United States, and the transnational organizations supporting Israel's brutal massacre in Gaza. Now, to continue on the topic of climate and ecological breakdown, activists did not have high expectations for the COP28 summit in Dubai, particularly after it was revealed that 2,456 fossil fuel lobbyists were attending the climate conference. The final agreement is a go-slow on fossil fuel phase-out, with oil company boss and COP28 president Sultan Ajaber even using the summit to secure fossil fuel deals. There has been heavy criticism from climate campaigners, with Cedric Schuster from the Alliance of Small Island States saying, we will not sign our death certificate. We cannot sign on to text that does not have strong commitments on phasing out fossil fuels. Former US Vice President Al Gore said it was the most embarrassing and dismal failure in 28 years of international climate negotiations. Oxfam International's climate policy lead, Nafkote Darby, said COP28 was doubly disappointing because it put no money on the table to help developing countries transition to renewable energies and rich countries again reneged on their obligations to help people being hit by the worst impacts of climate breakdown. Darby said developing countries and the poorest communities are left facing more debt, worsening inequality with less help and more danger and hunger and deprivation and that COP28 was miles away from the historic and ambitious outcome that was promised. And thousands of people from the Basque city of Guernica hit the city centre on December 8 in a stunning display of solidarity 
with the people of Gaza who are facing Israel's attacks. The thousands of people who assembled at the Pasialeku marketplace in Guernica formed a human mosaic depicting the Palestinian flag and part of Pablo Picasso's famed anti-war painting, Guernica. In the event organized by the Guernica Palestine Citizens Initiative, citizens, trade unionists, artists, anti-fascist groups, anti-war groups and activists from left-wing parties, including the United Left, condemned the Israeli bombardment of the Palestinian people and the city's anti-aircraft siren sounded for a minute, drawing parallels between Guernica's enduring pain from the bombing it faced during the Spanish Civil War and the ongoing airstrikes faced by the people of Gaza. So Guernica was bombed extensively by Nazi Germany during the Spanish Civil War and hundreds of civilians were killed and the protest insisted that the world and history must not accept a new Guernica and that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinian people and that the international community must share the suffering of the Palestinian people and stop the massacre. December 7th marked the 70th anniversary of Iranian Students' Day. Suspensions from education, expulsions, arrests and detentions of students in Iran have intensified since the Women, Life, Freedom protests began in September last year and are still continuing. Gender repression and segregation and force failing in Iran's universities have deepened. Women students are under enormous pressure. Since September, a wave of dismissals of Iranian university professors has been going on. Iran has a rich history of student campaigning and the plight of Iranian students remains a critical concern, necessitating global support to amplify their voices and advocate for a more inclusive, just and free society. The war in Sudan between the Sudanese Armed Forces, the SAF, and the Rapid Support Forces, the RSF, continues into its eighth month, killing thousands with no ceasefire in sight. Six million have been displaced and now deadly disease stalks millions as the health system completely collapsed due to attacks and shortages. Cholera is a huge issue. The deadly waterborne disease spreading through the displaced population in overcrowded camps, schools and and dormitories. There is little to no drinking water supply in these shelters and people have to buy water that has been transported through dangerous conditions. Those who cannot afford it have to drink from wells and streams that have been contaminated by the defecation and washing. There are not enough toilets and bathrooms. According to the World Health Organization, more than 3.1 million people are at risk of infection. Other diseases such as dengue fever, malaria, black fever, measles and others are also spreading in the humid climate and nearly half of the population are suffering from hunger. As the Sudanese Communist Party warned in a statement, war awakens forgotten diseases. And access to water is also under threat in Brazil with the Sao Paulo State Legislative Assembly voting to privatise its water and sanitation company on December 6th after the parliamentary session was briefly suspended, while security forces cleared anti-privatisation protesters from the gallery using batons and pepper spray. Green Left was present at the assembly during this repression and witnessed protesters with serious head injuries and many more, including journalists and parliamentarians, heavily affected by pepper spray. The vote was an important victory for right-wing Sao Paulo Governor Tarcicio de Freitas, a close ally of far-right former President Jair Bolsonaro. Many believe Tarcicio could be a presidential candidate if Bolsonaro cannot run in the 2026 elections, as Bolsonaro has been barred from office by the Federal Electoral Court, which found him guilty of abuse of power and misuse of the media. And similar privatizations in other states have only led to higher water bills and a deterioration in the quality of services. And the privatization is hugely unpopular with polling showing majority opposed to the privatization. Close to 900,000 citizens participated in a popular referendum on the issue that was organized by unions and social movements. 
And here's some audio that Greenleft recorded as the police began pepper spraying protesters. Some good news is that Russian anti war dissident and socialist Boris Kargalitsky has been freed by a Moscow military court on December 12th. Kargalitsky was detained in July on charges of justifying terrorism over comments he made on a since deleted YouTube video in October 2022 over the bombing of the Crimea Bridge. The court found Kargalitsky guilty but only required him to pay a fine of 600,000 rubles, which is roughly 6,600 US dollars, and banned him from editing any media outlet or web page for two years. Kargalitsky was the editor of leftist media platform Rabkor, workers' correspondent. Following Kargalitsky's arrest, a broad international solidarity movement developed calling for his freedom and the release of all political prisoners in Russia. Russian anti-war website Posla responded to the outcome on its Telegram channel. Today's release of Boris Kargalitsky is further proof of the benefits of solidarity campaigns and public participation. We would like today to serve as a reminder of how necessary it is to remember and support those repressed by the Russian regime. Only solidarity with each other can help us maintain strength in these difficult times and see a future for everyone. Now, in Sweden, Tesla mechanics and service workers have walk, walked out on a strike on October 27th after Tesla management refused to negotiate a collective agreement with their union. Postal workers, dock workers, cleaners and electricians also joined in refusing to work with Tesla products. The IF Metal Trade Union, which has 240,000 members, has said that it is able to finance those who are striking for more than 500 years. However, that didn't stop Tesla boss Elon Musk from publicly denouncing the strike, which is consistent with his union busting over the years. Unions throughout Scandinavia have signalled plans for their own blockages on Tesla products. These examples of international industrial action continue to demonstrate the enormous power working people have at their fingertips when they organize and coordinate across national borders. And a United States federal appeals court issued a decision on November 20 that could further undermine the right to vote for people of color. The decision curtails enforcement of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and opens the door to a return to Jim Crow racist laws which made it nearly impossible for African Americans to vote or function as equal citizens. The Voting Rights Act prohibits voting practices that discriminate on the basis of race or color. The case was sparked by voting rights groups who argued that the newly drawn congressional district boundaries weakened black voters' electoral power in Arkansas. But U.S. District Court Judge Lee Rodofsky dismissed the case on the grounds that only the U.S. government's Department of Justice can sue to enforce the Voting Rights Act. The matter will now likely be appealed in the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has a poor track record on supporting African-American voting rights. And this is a reminder that advances can be quickly rolled back if there is not a strong movement to support them. You can read more about all of the stories we talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. And so this is our final episode of the Green Left podcast for the year. And an end to the first year of the Green Less podcast is very exciting. Um, there will still be new articles and stories being uploaded over the summer break. Um, this podcast has been covering the latest activist news from Australia and around the world and discussing all the incredible campaigns that have been going on, including fighting for a better world against war, destruction, corruption and neglect that's imposed upon us by capitalism. So we're just going to have a little bit of a chat about the year that was 2023. I was looking forward towards 2024. And I think to kick things off, there's nowhere else to start but with the movement for Palestine, um, the horrific genocidal war that was launched by Israel 
uh, after October 7 has led to 20,000 deaths and more than a million people being displaced. But it's also kicked off one of the biggest international anti-war movements of our lives, with tens of thousands marching the streets every weekend in Australia for more than two months. And that's also happening around the world. And there's also, you know, countless other small actions going on throughout the week. So I guess to kick it off, like, what do you think the impact of this huge movement is going to be on you know, politics in general? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I think, um, like, it's just incredible to see that it, it, for the last couple of months, the crowds at these um, rallies nationwide and even actually worldwide, they're not going away. There are even more people are uh, starting to realise what is actually happening in Palestine. Um, and this is this will, I feel like, it's really helping people sort of awaken to the fact that they're, the, how the media is reporting this stuff and um, what is actually happening in some of these countries. I feel like there's a lot more people who are really um, starting to do their own research and form their own opinions instead of being lulled by um, propaganda, which, to be honest, Israel have really tried to, to do throughout this whole conflict. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really like to have a silver lining in this situation. It's really amazing to see people just continuing to, um, show their support and use their anger towards the situation for the greater good. And I hope next year, um, we'll be able to achieve even bigger things with the, not, not only this movement, but maybe any other movements that, um, pop up. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. And probably- Chloe, you've had some good experiences in terms of organizing some of these rallies and things um, and people reaching out who are really wanting to get active. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, I, and I, you know, appreciate what Gabriel just said as well. I think people are, um, you know, there are lots of people starting to self-organize in regional and local areas. The big mass rallies, I don't think we've ever seen anything like um, this in our lifetime. Um, Rallying, Big mass protests happening for what ten ten weeks straight now, um, but now you know there are lots of other groups in local areas um, that are are starting to build solidarity movements in their their local areas and also you know demanding that their local councils. We spoke a bit about local councils, uh, people, communities demanding their local councils to raise the Palestinian flag um, and to pass strong ceasefire motions. And this is important to, you know, a lot of a lot of people who support Palestine and feel scared, who have lost, um, we, you know, we, we've met so many p- people in the Palestinian communities that have actually lost, you know, over 30 members of their family in airstrikes. So it is actually very important um, to people in the community. People are starting to uh, open their eyes to to labour as well because, you know, there are lots of um, labour supporters out there and they're feeling really let down and also questioning the military alliance, AUKUS, um, and also why countries like um, Australia, the US, Britain are supporting Israel, they're asking, you know, they're linking it to um, imperialism. They are, um, you know, they're asking these very necessary questions and even linking it to the uh, climate. Like we just mentioned before, climate activist Greta Thunberg recently made that comment, there is no climate justice on occupied land. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, these are all all linking linking up these issues, even the refugee movement as well. Mm. Um, lots of refugee rights activists are, of course, um, you know, linking the the Palestine movement to the refugee movement. I mean, there's going to be so many refugees that are fleeing from Palestine, even though, you know, this is their home and they absolutely deserve to stay there. Um, but, you know, there's going to be lots of refugees as a result. And, um, you know, we, the Australian government have had, both major parties have had an appalling record on how they treat refugees. So, you know, it's, all these movements have, and, and also the housing crisis as well, people being moved from their land, I mean, in a much more bloody way to what's happening here, but people here are becoming homeless mm-hmm. and can absolutely relate, um, you know, in a small way to, to what is taking place. You know, what the stress of losing your home um, 
is you know having to move from your from your homeland is is very very stressful mm. um and on a smaller scale here in Australia if you're moved on um from your house it's it, it it can it can have a massive impact on mental illness um but i can't imagine what people are actually going through in gaza where they're all being squeezed into a small mm. small area the size of heathrow airport yeah. yeah and um and it's and it's good to see i feel like in the public eye um more and more every day we see that um people are holding these politicians accountable um so it's just a matter of like in legally like in the courts when will they start facing consequences for their actions cuz it's really just terrible how they can get away with all of this stuff and face no um repercussions um so i hope i'm sure that um as part of these palestine rallies and also rallies on other issues such as um housing and um refu- and the refugees um that people will continue to um ask for um ask for politicians to recognize um what they're doing and hopefully we'll see real change because people are getting people are getting more and more angry and that and maybe that will reflect in the next election we'll have to see but yeah i feel like it goes back to the fact that just people are having their eyes opened to uh what these the labor and liberal are doing to this country and yeah how there's so much how there's people who are doing so much better who but they just haven't had the opportunity yet so hopefully um that shows in the in the votes in next election and and also you know people are you know um linking what's happening in Palestine to capitalism as well. Mm. I mean people are we're, we are seeing seeing more and more layers of people joining the protest mm. movement and as a result actually opening their you know sort of um but a bit open mind more open minded about anti-capitalist ideas and and socialist socialist mm. working towards the socialist um you know what working towards socialist ideas as well. So that I think that's a really good thing. Mm. Yeah, I think uh really important point you made was that people are seeing that all of these different campaigns, you know, like anti-war, refugees, um, uh, environment, First Nations rights are all interconnected and the Pal- like the Palestine movement has really, you know, churned all of these movements together to uh, obviously because there's this um, terrible things happening in Gaza. Um, and yeah, you're right about uh, this bringing in all these new people, radicalizing all these people who might not have, you know, been involved in organizing protests or even attending these big protests have come out every weekend for the, for these huge rallies. Uh, this is before our, our time, but, uh, speaking to some older people at the recent green left forum who were around, uh, active during the Vietnam war, they were speaking about how that, you know, radicalized the whole generation of people and, um, kick-started the kind of activist lives of, of so many people. And I think there could be a similar uh, yeah. situation here where a lot of people get involved through this Palestine movement and, you know, see that, like, what can really bring change is people coming together, uh, protesting, holding rallies, organising forums and speak outs, and, and that can have a huge impact, you know, as, as Gabriel mentioned, on, you know, elections in future, but also just on all the various movements and campaigns. Um, just looking back to, it's kind of hard to even think back to the pre October seven before the Palestine movement kicked off. Um, Mm. but I was looking back at some of our previous episodes that we've recorded, um, earlier this throughout the year and feel free to go back and check them out on the podcast feed. Um, but some of the other huge issues, I'd say one of the, one of the biggest ones that we've talked about a lot on this podcast is the housing and cost of living crises with, um, you know, house prices and rents have just gone through the roof um, this year and kind of the government's not really done anything meaningful to address it. Uh, and then same with the cost of living. I mean, anyone will notice when you go and do your grocery shopping that it's costing, you know, an extra 50 bucks or an extra 100 bucks than it would, would have cost a couple of years ago. And I think it's really starting to impact everyone. Uh, and, you know, there's been some wins in campaigns for wage rises and things like that, but not anything significant enough to catch up with inflation. 
Um, and there's also been a kind of growing awareness that this inflation is being driven by corporate profiteering and price gouging and not actually by uh, people spending, you know, money. Um, so that's been another huge campaign. I know we've seen uh, anti-poverty activists coming together, the housing action that we mentioned earlier on the uh, on the episode. And I think that that could be another key uh, issue that will continue into 2024 and be the basis for a lot of campaigns. And I think because there's been this huge Palestine movement, there's, it's been taken a bit of a sideline over the last couple of months. But the cost of living crisis isn't, isn't just going to resolve itself. And things like rent freezes, rent caps um, are going to be necessary to you know, stop people from becoming homeless. So I think hopefully those campaigns will continue into the new year. And maybe if the government stops spending ridiculous sums of money on war mm. and, you know, yeah. building nuclear submarines that nobody wants um, and put it put it into public housing. Yeah, seeing yeah. $368 billion for nuclear submarines in this AUKUS alliance, particularly after seeing, you know, how the, pretty much the AUKUS alliance is supporting Israel so strongly, um, hopefully we can use that to point out that, you know, we don't want to be uh, in this these military alliances with the United States, um, mm. especially since the United States, like, and with this Palestine war, they've shown that they are irresponsible, and that we that an Australian people are um, losing trust very fast in the Americans if they'd already if they'd had any to begin with, um, just because they always seem to be. Well, now they seem to be on the wrong side. Um, ever since the Vietnam War and um, in the Middle East, like it's it's becoming very a very messy situation. Being um, us being connected with America and Britain as well. So yeah, hundred percent. And maybe that it's good to see that break in the uh, the UN General Assembly with uh, Australia not voting with the US and breaking and actually voting for a ceasefire. Maybe that's can be significant um, uh, we're yet to see it will rely on these movements continuing I just wanted to go to a, a bit of more of a positive story which is about uh, young people taking action we've kind of seen the re re-energizing of the school strike for climate movement this year particularly the second half of the year the, the students have been um, coming out for you know the climate strikes and also the student strikes for Palestine as well um, and even joining actions like the Rising Tide blockade, there was a significant number of uh, school students there. Uh, and also, you know, as we've seen at the Palestine rallies, a lot of young people. Um, so that's a kind of an exciting time. Um, what are your kind of thoughts on, you know, young people getting active? And, you know, uh, one other aspect, I guess, is the uh, Retail and Fast Food Workers Union, which has really gotten a lot of young people involved in union organizing and uh, in, you know, the kind of jobs that young people are in uh, retail, fast food, where they're not getting paid much. Um, and yeah, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's being a young person myself, being a high school student, it's very exciting. Um, uh, now COVID's gone, um, well, um, from our lives mostly, um, people are starting to regain their they're starting to realize that they have a lot of power um, and their voices do matter and they are going back to the pre-COVID ways of uh, fighting for what they believe in and which is really necessary because um, there's going to, like very soon, there's going to be a quite a big generational shift in politics and there'll be, and people from from my generation will... Um, hopefully be the ones in power um, and especially like with this climate movement is probably the main one that affects us because it's it's um, there's livelihoods at stake and the current governments are sort of not doing anything to help with that and in fact they're actively destroying it so it's it's amazing to see more and more young people they're getting passionate about these issues they're they're being um, woken um, from the sort of the COVID sort of slumber, um, and yeah, really starting to use their voices again to make change because it it is they are effective, um, and they're just starting to realise that. So, 
yeah, hopefully like for the next next years to come that we continue to see that change um, and as us as, as Australia as a country we be, become more and more progressive and start um, hopefully helping um, the minorities who really need our help. Yeah, well, yeah, well put. But I mean, COVID, just to, <laughs> I mean, COVID, COVID isn't out of the community. It's still very much, um, you know, killing, it is killing people. Um, but I, I guess like we're, because we're here, we're speaking from Melbourne, um, uh, Nam land and Isaacs and Gadi, I think both cities went through those huge lockdowns. So I guess like, you know, that, that did demobilize the climate movement a, a bit. Um, and yeah, the, you know, young people are, are starting to rise up and, you know, with Palestine, with, with the climate, um, with school strikes as well. And, and that's actually up against a lot of repression from their schools. So it's quite a brave thing to do to walk out of your classrooms, particularly if your school, your principal, your teachers, even your parent, you might, might, your parents might, um, tell you not to do it. Um, but it is actually, it's very important that that students do raise their voice on issues that are important to them, and you know tell tell labor to stop funding fossil fuels because it is their future. Hundred uh, percent. I'll we'll, we'll finish it up here with a uh, discussion around you know the fight for First Nations rights. So obviously this year we had the Voice to Parliament referendum, uh, which failed, uh, which lost, um, which was a bit of a slap in the face for a lot of uh, First Nations people and supporters, but uh, also kind of served the uh, government as a kind of distraction from a lot of the campaigns for, you know, ending deaths in custody, land rights and sovereignty. Um, so it's part of, kind of in a bit of a demobilization in the First Nations uh, campaigns, but I think heading into next year, the the first big uh, kind of protest usually most years uh, is the Invasion Day rallies across the country in January 26. So I think they're going to serve as a, you know, re a reboot, restart of the uh, movement for First Nations sovereignty and justice and also as a bit of a test to see, you know, all these like thousands of people who marched for the Yes campaign or uh, got involved, hopefully... Uh, they're not completely um, demoralized and will actually join the campaigns for, you know, ending deaths in custody and land rights. And, and I think Invasion Day 2024 is going to be the, the, the restart of, the, of those campaigns. I think you've sort of, you've, yeah, you have, you have kind of, I, I was trying to find out what Lydia Thorpe said after the voice failed. Um, it is a, you know, it is something, it is like what was one of main, of Labor's main projects. And I'm, I can't remember what she said, but she said something real, in, really inspiring, like, you know, something about the struggle after the voice referendum must continue. Um, I just can't remember what she said. I was trying to well, think One of the slogans that we, that we reported on in Green Left is um, not to agonize, but to organize. Yes, so even that's though what I was, it was trying to find. It was sad to see, you know, people voting no against the, uh, the voice proposal, even though it was very modest and, you know, wouldn't have made significant change, it still felt like a, uh, a lot of people felt disappointed by the result. Um, but yeah, it's, it kind of shows, you know, we can't just rely on, uh, governments to, you know, hand down these kind of m minor reforms to make change. We need to, you know, focus on the movements for justice. So, as always, if you want to find out about upcoming rallies, protests, forums, and cultural events that are happening, especially heading into the new year, you can head to the activist calendar at greenleft.org.au forward slash events. And if you're organizing any events that you want to submit to the calendar, uh, there's the add event feature or email events at greenleft.org.au. So make sure to check the calendar for Invasion Day protests in your city on January 26, as well as the Palestine rallies that are continuing over the summer holiday period. And if you have enjoyed this podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, 
climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. And a huge thanks to our editor and who the guy who creates the music that you're listening to in this podcast, Sean Valenzuela, for making Thanks, this Sean. podcast possible. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it without Sean's work. So you can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats on social media or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Green Left Online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. So thanks, Chloe and Gabriel. Uh, it was great to have you on the podcast. And also thanks thanks to our other co-hosts that we've had throughout the year, Ben, uh, Anissa, and Niall. Uh, It's been great to do this podcast and we'll come back to you next year in January. And and mostly thanks to the listeners who download the podcast, subscribe for actually listening and contributing as well um, if you are contributing to Green Left. But yeah, thanks, thanks for your for your attention, for listening to our podcast. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Stay staunch.